Hello, and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast. Today, I'm delighted to have as my guest, Silke Ahrens, who is VP of Channel Sales within EMEA and APAC for Phycotic Centrify. Silke and I go back many years when I was working with her company, and she's done a sterling job of growing channel sales for Phycotic. They've gone from 10 million to over a billion in about five and a half, six years, and all of their sales outside of the US are through the channel. She is the founder of the Mental Manager podcast, where they talk about mental health within sales. And this then led to an introduction that I made with Sean Doherty, who is founder of the 555 Club, .co.uk and owner of 555, where he offers bite-sized wellness for companies that actually care about the well-being of their staff. Today, we're going to be talking about why taking care of the wellness of your staff drives high performance. We're going to give concrete examples of where Silk has been able to build this into her team and the impact it's had. And we're going to look at Sean's experience of working with companies so that you can get a sense of why this isn't about bunny hugging and uh, tree hugging. This is actually a practical commercial decision. And doing the right thing is the right thing for the business as well. So Silke, Sean, welcome. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Marcus. Good to be here. Excellent. So Sean, let, let me start with you. I'm a gnarly, hairy ass CRO, head of sales. And you're now coming to me and telling me that I should uh, do a bit of this kumbaya stuff. Why is that, first of all, uh, a dinosaur-like attitude? And secondly, how is that hurting me and on my p and Why is it a dinosaur-like attitude? I'll, I'll address first. For anyone who's been in any way, shape or form active on LinkedIn over the last six months, you'll have seen just how bad the recruitment market is at the minute for companies looking for high-level staff. I'm fortunate to not be in that position where I'm looking for someone. But retaining top-level talent seems to be a really difficult thing. And not only retaining, but getting people in the door. People are, it's, it's moved beyond looking for a six-figure salary. It's moved beyond looking for, yeah, the nine to five in the office. From conversations with the sales guys, I know at the, you know, pretty much at the top of their game. What's pushing them away is companies that are set in the old standard of, we work in this office nine to five, you're here for this time, performance is measured in this way and anything outside of that uh, doesn't work. These guys have been, for want of a better word, using my services uh, for downtime, for meditation, to recharge for clarity from their own pocket. When asked what they do by their colleagues to attain top level status, you know, how are they hitting their target? How are they doing different things? Obviously there is the background outreach, all the client interfacing stuff. But to be able to switch off, to be able to sleep soundly at night, to be able to bring 100% of yourself to 100% of your task and not be split four different ways when you sit down to do something is a very effective tool and a very powerful proposition to bring somewhere. This is re really very interesting. So what I'd like to do uh, is bring Silker in at this point because you chose to bring Sean to work with your team. And I'm curious about what your initial reservations were. If you could answer that first, and then um, I've got a se series of questions that I'd like to uh, take you through. Honestly, I had zero reservations, but that's because I'm a massive fan of tree hugging and kumbaya. Uh, the, the challenge... <laughs> but, you know, joking aside, the challenge that I did see and um, that I guess I felt like I was taking, just taking a chance on was how people that are not quite as receptive as, as I am to mm -hmm. anything <laughs> related to hippies of the 60s would react to that. So, you know, it's, it's all well and good bringing any sort of coaching mentality into a team that is, is different from what a team actually knows today. And particularly when it comes to mindfulness, you can't force people to take this on, right? You can't say, well, I, I guess I could say, all right, if this is mandatory. You have to show up three times. You will a week. meditate. And, and you, you, will, will, you will be mindful of that. We insist on gratitude from half nine to 10 every morning. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So you can't, can't really do that. So I did have a concern or, um, you know, saw, saw that initially as a challenge is to 
how my team was going to react to this. And um, but taking a, a step back from that, the reason why I thought uh, when when Sean I first got talking about the five 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 club, why I thought immediately this is like I didn't even have to think about why I think this is a really fantastic and valuable idea for any company to employ is because it does it's you know, it doesn't just do one thing it addresses a number of different factors so it addresses um, the fact that particularly in a high performing environment uh, and in channel as you'll both very well know it's it's not exactly just going to cocktail parties and you know playing <laughs> golf with your partners but you are constantly in a conflict zone because everyone's got an opinion on how you can do better and what you should be doing. Everyone always feels like it's not enough. It's not doing the right things. Goalposts are constantly being moved. So it's, it's a very stressful environment. And to sustain in that environment and deliver very high value performance and to uh, not burn out, you need to recharge your batteries. Now, I think we're we're coming out of this thinking very slowly, um, and the pandemic has certainly helped in terms of getting the conversation going around uh, mental health. But I feel like in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, ever since I've been part of this industry, there's been this um, this thinking around the more hours you work, the better, the harder you you can essentially sit at your desk and Work, work summer and harder by doubling down on the mm-hmm. stuff that isn't working already. That's yeah, essentially exactly. the model. That's hundred percent. You know, that's it's outwork everyone else. Well, but if you outwork me, you just sit at your desk and do the same things like you just said for more hours, but get less results because you're just so burned out. So I wanted to do something um, that addresses burnout proactively, mm-hmm. and I feel that. The 555 Club, and maybe Sean, you can talk about what this 555 actually means um, so that it makes more sense to the listeners. That really does that. Okay, so just one quick question before we do delve into the 555. So in terms of turnover within your team, I'm curious to see how uh, you compare with uh, Like for Like in other organizations. I know that we're doing very well. I, I don't have the exact figures, but um, in the three and a half years that I've been part of it, we've had, uh, you know, let's say about 20% turnover. You probably have more figures around that than than mm-hmm. I do. And since you introduced 555? Uh, nothing, but we've been working together for about a month now. So oh, okay. <laughs> I don't think that's... 100%. That's, 100. <laughs> 100% retention rate. So uh, excellent. Just, we'll, leave, we'll leave that in because it would be cheating to edit that bit out. Um, <laughs> So, Sean, what is 555 as a concept? As a concept, it's bite-sized wellness, moving away from the wellness guru coming in once every three months and talking at your people for eight hours and then leaving with tips like sleep eight hours, walk 20 minutes a day, uh, meditate in the morning, read for 20 minutes, have a cold shower, do your yoga and do that by half eight in the morning and then come into work and everything will be fine. I am taking a lighthearted approach to that. But I, th- I think it was yourself, Marcus, that mentioned around sales training, uh, that a lot of training isn't training, it's exposure. So you're actually, um, people come in and train for a day and then they're gone. And, and that, you know, yeah. as, as anyone who's in sales it, knows. It's forgotten. It's, yes. If, if it's not reinforced, if it's not practiced with intent, and you know, real intention, um, then it goes away. And we, we see this all the time. You know, 70% of learning happens in the field, on the job, out of the classroom. And 90% of what's learned in the classroom is forgotten inside of a couple of weeks. Um, and f- within three months, d- virtually nothing sustains. Yeah. And that was a big factor in when I was putting this together, is that it's well and good saying that I will uh, take time for myself once every three months, but it doesn't happen. So the idea is, so the 555, it's, it's just an abbreviation of five minutes. So it's five minutes of breath work five minutes of meditation and five minutes of gratitude. Uh, so even those you, words. Why, why do you do those three uh, elements? Can you uh, break them down uh, yeah. in terms of the, the thinking behind the process? Yes, of course. For, first of all, there's nothing complicated there by design. A lot of people have triggers around meditation and things like that, that you have to be sitting in a blanket in a cave for six months. And that's something that other people do. I'm 
terrible at meditating. Uh, if if that if you can say such a thing, you know, it's, it's I find it so difficult. Uh, I have to wrestle my thoughts, beat them to the ground. But I always take something out of it when I take the time, sit there. So the five minutes, it's five minutes of breath work. That's designed to get you out of your head. Whenever you breathe in a continuous loop for five minutes with no pause at the top, no pause at the bottom, uh, you're moving out of that part of your brain that's sitting going, why am I here listening to this bald Irish guy talking in my ear? So once that switches off, you then drop into your body. The five minutes of meditation, it's purely designed to get people to realize that all we have is this moment, you know, and we're not trying to attain enlightenment. We're not trying to move towards a higher state of being just to come back that all we have is this moment. Where that came from me was that around the time I first met you, Marcus, I wasn't happy in my career at the time. I'd spent, so 10 years previous diagnosed with cancer, two years after that was told there's nothing we can do for you. And then eventually ended up as a financial advisor. And found myself quite unhappy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's damning when you've hit rock bottom. You've to yeah. <laughs> so, there, are, there are other types of financial advice. You can become a wealth manager and you can elevate your status. Yes. <laughs> um, so, so over, uh, found myself sitting you know, in a career, not a job, which is what I was attaining for when I couldn't work. I'm not happy. And one of the things I, you know, I sat, it was October 2019, sat journaling and realized that I was, you know, why was I, why did I have more joy in 2012 going through radiotherapy, going through chemo than I had in my current life? You know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I had happiness wow. in 2012. I wouldn't say I was happy, but there was joy. Um, so one of the things that I really reflected on was that in 2012, I wasn't living six weeks ahead of myself. I wasn't living six months ahead of myself. Today was good. Uh, you know, I felt good today and I will deal with tomorrow when it comes how interesting. And, and that was how I spent my life at the time because, yeah, you, you, you just didn't put yourself six months ahead whenever you're going through that stuff. Whereas I found myself now, it's like, okay, I was comparing salary to friends who were working for the 10 years I wasn't working. I was comparing my body to people who were training for 10 years when I wasn't training. I was, you know, com comparison is a thief of joy. So I realized that I wasn't uh, grounding myself in this moment. And that was the point where I consciously decided I'm, you know, I'm going to start making changes. Shortly after that, I think I was speaking with you, Marcus. We started working together. Yeah, and, and a very long-winded approach to that. It was realizing that my unhappiness came from living beyond where I was in this moment. Um, so putting myself in the future or comparing myself to the past. So the five minutes of meditation, it's going to sound like, how the hell can we get there in five minutes? But that's why it is a re re continuous thing. It's just the realizing of, shit, I'm find myself stressing about the deadline. I've messed up October. Uh, October's gone. You don't have October. December's gone. You don't have December. The only point we have right now is, you know, it's currently Friday, the 5th of November, at 23 minutes past eight in the morning. This is the only minute I have. It's the only breath I have. So if I want to change something in my life and my career and my business, this is the only point I can do it in. And the more we can drop back into this moment, realize that, you know, wherever we are today, this is all we have. That's the idea behind the five minutes of meditation reinforced. So the five minutes of gratitude is designed really to bring appreciation to the things in our lives that we don't, that we don't often look at. One of the first times I did this exercise live, uh, a lady jokingly said to me, I got out of bed this morning. And then, and then she caught herself like, I got out of bed this morning. It's like, yep, you got out of bed. And, and then went a layer deeper. It's like, I could get out of bed. I have a bed to sleep in. I had blankets. I slept last night. And it was like a group of 10 people. And this whole conversation spiraled out from a joke remark of, I got out of, you know, I got out of bed this morning. But we don't realize those things. We don't appreciate those things. We don't, yeah, we don't take the time to actually realize, you know what? Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. If you're ever struggling with gratitude in your day-to-day -day life, just start removing things you use. You know, if you're not happy with your car, visualize it gone. You don't have a car anymore. You have to walk and take the bus. The car becomes pretty attractive pretty fast. Um, I, I remember a Julia, Julia Donaldson book about that. So this woman didn't like the size of her house. So she spoke to the rabbi, said, bring in a chicken, bring in a chicken. Anyway, so it spirals to the point where she has a cow, a pig, a horse, um, a goat, a sheep, and the chicken. And eventually, so she uh, says, there's no room in my house. So she eventually, uh, the rabbi gets rid of the cow, the horse, and so on. Then there's plenty of room. 
Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it, it's really interesting. Okay. So, Silco, what I'm curious about is the effect uh, on not having a way to de-stress that is habituated in terms of the performance of individuals. Yeah, I think it's a very real effect. And I, I can start with myself as an, as, as an example, you know, when... Okay. Or, or you know, anyone in my team um, that is uh, is building these habits with Sean. I think what we can really see if we compared it is that to have. All right, let me start by, <laughs> what would the situation be if we didn't continue with this um, five 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 club habit? Uh, you know, I think it's so so easy to get extremely overwhelmed, to have uh, real bouts of anxiety catching you at any point during the day, just because of the amount of workload. And I think I actually saw a comment that I quite liked on, on I can't remember, I think it was LinkedIn, um, where it basically says that burnout is not, I don't even remember what it, what it isn't, but it, it kind of said something along the lines of burnout is the anxiety that comes with just too much workload, not enough bandwidth. And I think particularly in, in our field, and I'm sure in, in many other fields as well, that you just have so much in terms of workload. And if you don't have, and it starts with that, a good way to prioritize that, it is so easy to just get washed over and overwhelmed with all of that. So to have um, the opportunity to reset for 15 minutes, that gives you all of a sudden, a point of clarity again as to, okay, shit, what, what is actually really important here? What should I be focusing on? What can I change in this moment? I, I always find it so powerful when, when Sean mentions, you know, all we have is this moment. It's like, yeah, okay, that's that's actually true. We have this moment. So what can I affect in this moment once we finish with a 555 club? What am I going to be doing then? And to reinforce that on a continuous basis has a really powerful effect. And I find on both the mental health and mental well-being of everyone, which of course lends itself to retention, but also on the productivity. Because all of a sudden you get much better results, much quicker. So this is really interesting. Let me ask you this. It sounds to me, actually, what we're talking about at a psychological level, some of you will have heard me talk about operating from the drama triangle or the winner's triangle. In the drama triangle, the triangle is on its point, and that's the voice of the victim. You have the persecutor in one corner and the rescuer in the other. And it's called the drama triangle, and it's driven by ego. Uh, ego thrives on drama. And in that state, there is a very high level of attachment to the outcome, which is not being present. It's worrying about the future or dragging uh, negative history into the present moment and suffering the torment of it all over again. And the victim voice is, why me? It's so unfair. You know, the universe is dumping on me. This always happens. The persecutor comes with a jabby ind index finger and the pronoun you is it stabs you in the face or chest, and it diminishes you at an identity level, at who you are. The rescuer is actually, I see that as the most divisive position in management, because you diminish the other person by taking away their power. Uh, it's about micromanaging, it's helping without boundaries or permission. And if you think about the kind of environment that manage, bad managers create, they tend to operate from there with a command and control, um, which is, again, projecting into the future, looking at things like forecasts, over which you have zero control. You have the only control of the behavior and the input. You don't have control of the output. And so this is all about attachment, whereas what you're describing is moving into the winner's triangle, where instead of being a victim, you're vulnerable. Instead of being a persecutor, you're assertive. And instead of being a rescuer, you're nurturing, you're empath empathetic, and you pay attention, got compassion. And this is where you can be your authentic self because you're fully present, you're fully in the moment, your focus is on the here and now, whether that's whether you're meditating, doing breath work, being grateful, or in fact, whether you're working with other people in a management capacity or a sales capacity. So what I've seen is where people operate from that winner's triangle their performance is 15, 20 times higher 
than average. I see this all the time with top performers, both in management and in sales. So Silke, let's bring you in on this. Um, in terms of the psychology at a management level, uh, in order to enable your managers of channel, how are you combining the two? So do you mean how, how am I combining the, um, the the winner's triangle and the 555 club? Or Yes. Yeah. The 555 club kind of automatically lends itself to then turning the, the drama triangle, if you will, on its head and creating the winner triangle without me necessarily needing to do anything. So now, of course, what I do is to encourage the team to attempt this and to utilize the, the service. And what I always make sure is I, I ensure that we continuously go through why is this a good thing? Why does it make sense? And what's in it for you? Because as um, I think you've, you've taught me many years ago, Marcus, people do things for their reasons, not for yours. And that is something that, you know, I, I, I keep driving. Um, and then the output or the result of that is automatically a move into the winner's triangle without you know, any additional action necessary, if you will. What's really interesting is to get control, you have to give it up. To get trust, you have to give it. And to create the conditions of safety, you have to put the orientation towards others before orientation towards yourself. And I suspect, Sean, this is where gratitude really plays an important part, uh, becoming more aware and self-aware of your part within your community, within your team, within your family. I, I'd be curious to hear stories around that. Uh, how long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> About seven minutes. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I would say quite frequently on a call, uh, and it, you know, it sounds like a pass away remark, but it's a, if any one person takes you know, one-tenth what I'm getting from every session, they are leaving with a whole lot. Because each time I sit with a pen and paper, just to read through like Monday's list, and it's only, it's only seven or eight points because you only have five minutes. Grateful for, uh, I won't name the name, a sales leader and his team. Uh, grateful for every person that turned up today to be able to move my body is on there. The dynamics to be able to sit. Two Sundays ago, I met my sister and my mom and my dad for a cup of coffee. And on the day, it was nice. And then on the Monday, as I was sitting doing my 555, I got to reflect. I, like, I actually spent time with my family for an hour uh, and talked and sat and, you know, and physically touched them because you couldn't do that for flipping 18 months. And it's just bringing that realization in, slowing down to speed up, slowing down. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Versus shit, I have to go meet mom and dad for a coffee for an hour. And that's a half an hour drive and uh, flip up the patties in the car. And it's that old cheesy line of move your have tos to get tos. And, you know, and, and there's something in that. But again, another thing I try and drive home is that like, grat like gratitude is everywhere at the minute. You know, any really top influencer is talking about gratitude. Try and drive in that it's not a writing exercise. Like, you know, a writing exercise is what you had to do for, you know, whenever I used to mess up at school, I had to do a hundred lines of I will not pull Nolene's hair. Gratituding is a feeling exercise. Can you bring that feeling into your body of, I'm getting to experience this right now? Out of curiosity, can you explain the, the impact on the body in terms of endorphins and the biochemistry of it? From a science point of view, no, I can't. Okay. But I invite, but I invite anyone to sit with their breath for a minute and think about something they're grateful for and notice how their body changes, notice how their feeling changes and notice how their thought changes. And if you need a study after that to validate it, then there's probably no further conversation for us to have. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I would add to that, um, you know, for me, uh, gratitude and bringing it back to the business side is really about gaining perspective. So very often when you're joining a session and uh, you may have negative whole negative feelings towards I don't know an email that you've just received or just feeling very stressed and overwhelmed or um, stressing out about the future or whatnot and then you start with this exercise and what I encourage people to do is to as Sean just said the have to's I have to write this email to I get to and then one of the the things that Sean um, has mentioned before was that 
you know, if, if you start writing, I am grateful, and then dig a little bit deeper and say, I'm grateful because. So you could say, I'm grateful that I get to write this email because, because it's, uh, you know, it means I've got a job. And uh, what does that mean? You know, it means that I can pay my mortgage, I can put food on the table, and, you know, I, I get to grow. So I think that's, uh, that brings it uh, very, uh, very much back to the business side as well. I understand that you actually paid for this out of your own pocket. Yes, I did. Excellent. Okay. So that demonstrates a very high level of commitment. In the month that you've been doing uh, this work with Sean, what are the personal changes that you've been able to experience? So I've definitely been able to experience it, not just me. That's also the feedback from um, some of the people that have attended. I'm, I'm coming to that one. Okay. I definitely All right. To okay. Too. Okay. I'll take that one separate. So for me personally, I've uh, whenever I attend a session, I can feel a real shift, a physical shift, in the signs of tension, stress being removed, and I can feel that I have a lot more clarity and I get things done quicker because I'm able to focus much better. So those are just some of the things. Okay, so one of my big themes this year is management enablement. So I'm pulling together a load of really clever technologies, uh, approaches. I've just uh, taken on a new client that drives management enablement and operational coaching across hundreds of managers all at once and being able to coach in moments instead of having to sit down for an hour and coach them. And the net result for performance, so they're getting up to 74 times ROI. So for £300, £22,200 ROI per person, which is pretty damn impressive. Um, but I see this as part of that management enablement because managers are the most under pressure. Most managers are under pressure, the most undervalued, undertrained, and undersupported, and undercoached people within almost any business. And therefore, they are in the most precarious position, both in terms of security, but also in terms of mental well being and burnout. So I'd love to hear the effect that you have uh, been given feedback on from your team within this month. Yeah, absolutely. And and I mean, I would just agree with everything you've just said. It's uh, so important to really address that management support and essentially ensure that there is no burnout at that level. Because if you're burned out, if you've got a burned out management layer and they still stick around, then, you know, just imagine what effect that is going to have of the rest of the organization and the performance overall. So I'll just leave that there. But then, um, so from my team, the the feedback that I've received has been starting from, you know, it's, it's just really nice to be able to reset and take a breather and to actually uh, check in with myself rather than having to run 100 miles an hour at all times. And we all know, we all talk about self-care a whole lot. It's very trendy at the moment, but what does that actually mean and how is it possible? Is it just a self-care Sunday and, you know, you get your nails done or is it really something that you need to do and build a habit around? And um, that's what some of the people have been saying that, Having it as a as a truly bite sized opportunity, uh, peppered throughout the day at three different times, uh, three different days a week, four times during those days, that really gives them a, the easy opportunity. And easy is really important here. It's simple and it's easy to access. You don't need to go to the gym. You don't need to do anything. You just need to connect by your phone or via Zoom on your laptop, and and you're there. And that makes such a big difference. So you're doing this practice four times a day. No, you have the option to do this for time. Okay. Day. Okay. So uh, again, once is enough. If you do it more frequently, do you find that there's a flywheel effect, Sean? In my experience of messing up and needing to do this, it's helpful when you need it and it's effective when you don't. It's much easier to maintain your car engine than it is to drive it into the ground and then repair it. I find the same with, with my fitness, with my diet, with my health, with my walking. And this is exactly the same thing. It's nice to have it whenever you're stressed out and overwhelmed, but it's much easier to maintain a peaceful state of being, a focused state of being, a grateful state of being whenever you're doing it, when you feel pretty good about yourself, when you feel pretty happy with your work. Interesting. Okay. If we think about questions that leadership should be asking, Silke, 
I'm very curious about the questions that remain unasked around mental health and wellness and the impact that has on turnover on uh, and retention of top talent and uh, attraction uh, you know make, making you a destination employer making you a, a team that people within the team recommend to others that they care about to join an interesting question marcus <laughs> so i think uh, two two questions come immediately to mind and one is really simple and it is how are you really because we start every conversation with how are you oh i'm i'm good or i'm muddling through or you know i'm okay but no one has ever asked the follow up question because very often in that moment we don't care we just want to get through whatever the meeting is about so i think you know for managers to make sure that they actually you know become this destination employer uh, for the company that's that's a really important question that should be asked frequently so that you really understand what is going on with your employees and and then as an extension of that really understand how you can provide support and the second question that i would recommend for people to ask and this is something that i asked during every interview actually what are the habits that you have that make you successful and yes marcus you're smiling i learned that one from you love that you made my <laughs> it's, week it's an excellent question because very often what i find is that people stop and say what do you mean habits and then they give me an answer that is really it's got nothing to do with a habit so it is um Yeah, I find that a very powerful question. And then because I don't expect people to tell me, okay, these are my 15 habits and I've really thought through this very deeply. What I would then follow up with is, okay, so do you understand why habits are important? How habits can, or I mean, make all the difference between being successful and in a sustainable way or being opportunistically successful it's all about habits and um yeah and and then i find it is should really be down to the manager to provide a guide and best practice and suggestions examples what as you will to help every employer build habits that make them successful because the habits that i have may not be fitting for you know for everyone else so i think that is um, that should be part of every career development couldn't agree more and the fact that you're asking about habits that early in the process is really key because what you do repeatedly in the past you're likely to do repeatedly in the future and the real uh, skill i think of great managers is to identify those habits that serve the individual and gently nurture them into developing them so that the chains are so light they hardly notice at the beginning and by the time the habits been properly formed the chains are too difficult to break to uh, paraphrase uh, Warren Buffett who stole the quote from someone else so help me get to grips with this then Sean you said something earlier that um it's helpful when you need it and it's effective when you don't so talk to me about the awareness that happens when you practice the this uh, approach on a daily basis and the how it raises self awareness and awareness of the moment hmm it's a good question i'll speak from you know i'll speak from my own experience which is you know really the only experience i can speak from and i'll go right back to whenever yeah when i wasn't well i was going through numerous different cancer treatments and at the time my mindset wasn't on that i was the captain of my ship that i was you know that i was driving the car it was there was a team of people who were going to help me and whatever they told me to do that's fine and i outsourced that and then everything else i do is over here for me uh, i didn't you know didn't look at anything i could do in terms of who i was hanging around with the conversations i was having what i was putting into my brain what i was putting into my body and then slowly but surely it was actually it was a conversation with a lady and she pretty much said to me that where you are today is a result of everything you've ever done in your life so this is ultimately your fault and i was like how dare you how dare you suggest this is my fault uh, and then about a week later i realized well if it's my fault if i caused this mess then maybe i can help get myself out of it whereas if it's not my fault uh, i have no control and i'm powerless in this situation and uh, so 
taking responsibility and blame for things uh, help, helps you a lot, actually. And then to tie that into the awareness and how it's impacted, this started coming to me more and more before I even, you know, before I started learning about this and practicing it actively. It would be, the best example I can give would be two years ago, walking my dogs in December in the driving rain. And it was freezing. <laughs> and I just had a feeling of, this is incredible. This is, this is amazing. I took off my hat and I opened my coat and I like, walked in the freezing cold in my t-shirt up the Melmount Road in Strabane. Because uh, I realized that like, th this, this was the dream of Sean from eight years previous. This is what I had I, you know, I aimed to get. And like, I came in soaking cold. My wife was like, you know, what the fuck are you doing? Um, <laughs> and I, I just, it, was, it was the most incredible because I was just in the moment rather than complaining about the rain. And it seems like such an out there example. But it was a real turning point for me in, yeah, in my whole awareness and appreciation of what is and just enjoying this moment, each step, you know, each struggle, each raindrop. It really was a turning point um, in that awareness. You, you've reminded me of two very useful nuggets that people can take away from today. One is a re resilience platform that's also very good for discovering and diagnosing a situation in a sales uh, conversation. Uh, around pain and uh, better outcomes. And that's called CORE, C-O-R-E, Control, Ownership, Reach, and Endurance. Stoltz talks about it as a resilience tool. So what do you have control over? What are you able to respond to? What are you responsible for in terms of owning at least your part in the situation that got you there, where you are, and what actions you can take? The reach is the ripple effect of you choosing to make a change for the better. And endurance is, how, what's your tolerance? How long have you put up with it? And you know, taking you through that uh, journey of realizing that for 10 years you've been through treatment, and instead of whining and moaning about the weather and the cold and the wet, you were fully present in the moment because the realization, the, the gratitude for going through that journey. And this then takes us to the Buddhist mantra for happiness, which everybody should practice. And the trick is to take an index card, and whatever day it is that you start this exercise, that's the first column. And it's, say, it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And the Buddhist mantra for happiness comes in three parts. Never complain about anything, even to myself. And that means even in thought. So no judging, no comparison, no blaming, no whining, no moaning, no grumbling, no bitching, nothing. And the moment you realize you are falling into that subroutine, you just tally on the day and you count up the number of tallies. And the exercise is not about trying to force you to change your behavior. It's simply making you aware of the physiological and mental shift when you're starting to go into ingratitude, into judgment into not being fully present. To just jump on that, that that's something I would talk about as well. Is like we're not trying to achieve anything with this process. We're not trying to accomplish anything. You know, there's nothing to do. It's just to become aware. Am I anxious? Oh, shit, I am. What am I anxious about? Oh, yeah, it's, it's the 50 phone calls I have to make this afternoon. Okay, I'm not there. And then to bring it back to what you said about, you know, present moment awareness, even go, there's a guy who talks about in this moment, there's rarely anything wrong. And of course, there's always going to be that one example in 100 where there is something wrong. But if, you know, I'm going to keep because of the nature of this podcast, go back to the cold calling, the anxiety around cold calling. That's a future anxiety. It's like bring it to the microsecond, lift the phone, there's nothing wrong. You're holding the phone, there's still nothing wrong in this moment. Press the first number, there is nothing wrong. You're just touching a number on the screen. It's the anxiety about what's coming next is causing the fear of the cold call. Absolutely fantastic. I, I had a client years and years ago who was a cage fighter for a kick. So he, he would always come in covered in bruises. However, he was only five foot six and he was beating people who are six foot because he was really very, very good at staying present in his run up and to the, the bout. And in the bout, he was always focused on that moment. He wasn't thinking about his next move. And I've uh, done uh, a little bit work on the podcast uh, with people who train MMA fighters. And it's really interesting how important it is that they are 
at their most excellent in that moment and they're not thinking about the championship or the victory or even what their next kick is going to be. They're simply in the moment and responding to the opponent. And the moment they start to get ahead of themselves, their ego starts to take over. That's where they get stuck in the future. They get a little bit sloppy, a little bit slow. They take a punch. Then that starts their anxiety. And now they're back in that drama triangle. So whether it's in uh, full contact blood sports or it's in business or just in life, it's so important to stay present. Okay, Silka, we need to wrap up now. So if you were to give one bit of advice to a senior sales leader, what would it be? If you want to create a burnout prevention habit, if that's not a thing, then I'm making it a thing now. If you want to create that within your team, you should want to create that to retain your talent and to develop your talent. So if you want to do that, then you need to make it as easy as possible and as accessible as possible for your team to get engaged into doing that and into building that habit today so that it will serve them and you and as an extension of that, your company tomorrow. That is fabulous advice. So Sean, what would your piece of advice be to someone who is in a stressful role and is starting to feel the symptoms, if not the effects of burnout. My first would be a question is, is this the right role for you? You know, are you chronically stressed everywhere you are? Or is this role stressing you out? Is the first one. And it comes back to that awareness. I put a lot of my illness down to the stress I was under at the time. I had 10 friends in the same stress and they weren't, they, they weren't, you know, they didn't follow. They managed it a lot better than I did. So on reflection, was probably the wrong role for me. I was probably higher than I should have been at the age and the experience I had. And I took it all too personally. And if you're looking for tools and a conversation, first of all, is acknowledge you're stressed. That puts you ahead of 98% of the pack straight away. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually stressed rather than running around in a heightened state and kicking the dog and blaming your wife or your husband or for everything else. Um, so when you slow down and I say, you know what, I am pretty stressed. And then... It's okay. So what works for you? Is it walking? Is it reading? Is it more sleep? Is it better food? Is it karaoke? And then it's finding things that you can do <laughs> to relieve that stress. I think a lot of it is surface level and you need to go a couple of layers deeper as to what the stress is. Very interesting. Sadly, we've run out of time. However, I think we should do more of these because I can see real value and for those of you in the audience, please get in touch. If you have questions around preventing stress, preventing burnout, if you have questions that are going through your mind uh, around how you can create an environment where your buyers feel safe, your sellers feel safe, your partners feel safe, and you feel safe as well, then please get in touch because... I'm certainly working on these issues. And I know Silka and Sean are uh, top of their game practitioners. So please do get in touch with your questions and your comments. Silka, how can people get hold of you? Uh, ideally, add me on LinkedIn, Silka Ahrens. That's going to be the easiest. Excellent. And Sean? Yeah, same here. Sean Doherty. That's S-H-A-U-N-D-O-H-E-R-T-Y. I'm the smiling ball guy. Your website? The website is the 555club.co.uk. And, and 555 are numerals. Yes, numerals. Um, and how can people get onto your classes? They can shoot me a DM on LinkedIn or send an email through the contact form on the website. I think my number's on the website too, so feel free to WhatsApp or give a call um, and, and to be more than happy to get people on. And I'm much more concerned with people using this than I am with squeezing every penny out of everyone. So if, uh, if people want to get on for a while and see if they can get something from it, uh, I'm, I'm more than open to that. And just to be absolutely clear, it really isn't expensive. You can pay for it yourself, even if you're on a very low basic. Mm. And it's intended that way. So yeah. Sean Doherty, Silka Ahrens, thank you. Marcus, pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent. So this is Marcus Kauke chilling out on the Inquisitor podcast. If you'd like to get hold of me, Marcus at laughs-last.com or DM me on LinkedIn. And if you're really interested 
in uh, the whole topic of mental well-being, mental health, then Silka, how can people listen to your podcast? The podcast is called The Mental Manager, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and probably 90% of all of the other platforms. <laughs> Excellent. So this is me signing off. In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.